There we go. We are on the air. Let's eat. Not yet, a little bit. A little bit. Why just show you God's menu? Hell, we're all starving. Let's eat. So the video, what's he say? I mean, he's talking about the solution in the video. I mean, I really, I, 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 it sounded like something I heard before, right? The, the solution is within us. The solution is within us. And we've been talking about, uh, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about these prophets. And, and the idea is, and in the meditation, we're talking about being on this spiritual journey. That we are moving from a place of self-absorption. We are moving from a place of self-centeredness. We are moving from isolation into that place of harmony and unity. We are moving from the place of fear into the place of love. But it's all on the inside. This is what it's all happening within. So, uh, our, if we have a condition of feeling separate. If we have a condition of, if we are lonely, that is within. It really has very little to do with who is with us. And everything to do with how we are feeling on the inside. And so this, this spiritual path of going from that, that, that fear-based thought system that says to us we are alone in a hostile world. We are alone in a dangerous place. To go from that thinking into the thinking that we're all in this together. That we're all in this together. And that each one of us can do something, our thing. That, that each one of us has our own like task, our own job to do and it's not a job that's a burden although sometimes it can it can seem that way but if we think back the only time it seems like a burden is when we are lost again in self-centeredness so this task that we have is just to take that which we find within us the love that we find within us and then give it to the world and as we do so we will see a change in the world around us. So this is what, and this is what the prophets did. This is what all of these mystics, this is what they did. They had an inner experience. They went within and had visions. And many of these visions seemed, they were so real. I mean, they were real in a, in a sense. They, that, that they seemed to be in the world itself. But they were actually more real than the world itself. But so these, these guys, which in this being on this path, we are moving to this consciousness of being, to, uh, we are moving to a mystical consciousness where we have inner experiences that illuminate us and prepare us to give that light to the world. To give that light to those around us. So this, um, well, we just go to, uh, well, I'll, I'll, to this morning I've got this this stuff here that I that uh, I wanted to talk about. That uh, the Bible stories. Uh, it, we'll start with the the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. All of these stories are. Stories that are designed to trigger an inner experience. They're, we can think about it as being available on three levels. And we've talked about this before. First of all is the, is the story that's like right on the surface. And that story can be entertaining, that story can be instructive in some way, and there's some benefits to that surface. It's the literal story. We do not want to be stuck, though, with the literal story. What we want to do is take a moment reading the story and think about what does this mean to me? What is this story saying to me in my life right now? 
And we can do this with the Bible. We can do this with any spiritual literature. To be quiet for a moment and see how this story relates to what's going on in my life today. And, and it actually is true. You can take any spiritual literature and let it fall open to any page. And if we read it in that way, there will be a message there for our life right now in this moment. And this is the mental aspect. This is just the mental aspect of, of uh, trying to relate to it as to what's going on in our own lives. And then there's the deeper, the deeper thing. The deeper thing is the spiritual experience. Uh, what I like to say, that is the, the, the part of the story that fires something in us. It, it fires something. It inspires our heart. And so what, what, the, what the mystical experience is about is actually having that fire. It's not just having an intellectual relationship, which is fine. And I don't want to denigrate any of it because the surface story, that's fine. It's a great story. We need to remember that it's not history, but it's a great story, and we can get something just at the surface. The, the, the mental aspect, it's fine. It gets us thinking about how we can practice these principles. But it is that deep level of the spirit where, we, where it actually sets us on fire. This is what we're seeking. And then from that place of inspiration, then, we become an inspiration to others. Not to everybody. Some people are going, what's wrong with him? Something wrong with that guy. Crazy. Crazy. So, I wrote a poem about this. Hopefully it doesn't take me too long to find it. So, the idea, of course, is that we can't just be doing this for ourselves. The, um, we're doing it so that we can be illuminated, but also so that we can share it. Because if in the sharing then, we fulfill our purpose, which is to be helpful, but we also get recharged. We get we get something back from it. It's not just that we're get, we're, we actually get more back. Then we get, so we give some inspiration. We in turn become more inspired than we were before. So this poem is called "Take the Plunge." Love is like a river with many currents. On the top, only one is felt. Shallow transient, but even skimming along the surface, we can be transported state to state. Past that level, take the plunge. Further down below to the place where flow excites much mystery and delight. Then deeper down the undertow, once feared but now sought out, in which we mix and merge and grateful gladly drown. And in the drowning find not dark nor death but light and love and God. So this is this is the th so on the surface. I was thinking, you know, when I I was reading a poem, and and there, something in it was about going deeper, and I had this vision of the Rock River. Okay. Now, the rock, when I was a kid, I used to hang around downtown. And I would climb on the Jefferson Street Bridge. That's that bridge right there in that second picture. 
and I would get up on those arches that go across. And I try to catch pigeons and stuff like that. I just hang out up there, smoke cigarettes. <laughs> and uh, one day, I fell off and fell in the river. And, uh, and, and I was a good swimmer, so I wasn't scared, except that I went down deep enough that I felt what people said, the reason why you don't swim in the Rock River. There's a big undertow in the Rock River. And it was pulling at me. Now I got, I, of course, here I am. It's fine. I got, I got out of it. I got to the shore and I, and I, I, I like snuck home all the way through the back alleys, and then got, got my clothes off and changed clothes and put them in the in the laundry so that nobody knew what happened. Didn't I mean because? Well, here's the thing. I would have, I fell in the river, almost drowned, but would have took a whooping if the, if anybody would have found out <laughs> that I had fallen in the river. So anyway, the, but it came, that vision came to me when I started to write the poem about the undertow being something that we're afraid of, but in the spiritual life, that it actually is. We want the thing. We want that power that is greater than our ability to swim out of it to take us under. And it is a fearful thing, especially the first time we have this experience. But it really is that which reveals life and light and God. So this is what we're after. We're after this. And uh, so in, in this whole range of... And by the way, in Islam, now you wouldn't think... I'm going to tell you Jesus was a prophet, okay? Jesus was a prophet. Now we don't... Most in mainstream Christianity, that's not what people would say. Right? But in Islam, Jesus is a prophet. Right? Moses was a prophet. In, in, Jewish, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, Moses is the greatest prophet, of course, because he saw God face to face, except he couldn't see God face to face because he would die, but he got to see God's butt, if you remember that from the last time we talked about it. But So I'll tell you the Moses story first. Moses, going through the desert, comes upon a man who is on the ground praying. And the man is praying to God and he is saying, Oh God, I want to kiss your little feet. And all sorts of little nonsensical things that seem very childish. And Moses says to the man, What is wrong with you? Praying like that to God. What is God? Does God have feet? Does and he said something in his prayer about, I want to put little shoes on your little feet. Now he's talking to God like this, right? Like he's, and, and, uh, and Moses is telling him is that the quality of his prayers are not up to snuff. And the guy is chastened. He goes, oh, I don't know. He says, I don't know how to pray. Tell me how to pray. So Moses gives him a prayer. Tells him, this is how you pray. This is what you do. Like this. And then Moses leaves him. And all of a sudden, a vision comes to Moses as he's gone down the road. And God says, Moses, what did you do to my person back there? And he said, well, he was praying crazy. And God says to Moses, he was loving me. He was loving me. And I was well pleased with his prayer. And so Moses went back to the man and he said, I am so sorry. I was in error. Go back to praying how you were praying before. He said, no. He said, Moses, it's all right. It's all right. You woke me up. So now I am praying differently. I'm, but he said, I'm not praying the way you told me. But I'm praying differently because you have awoken a different level in me. The whole idea is there are no rules. There are no rules for worship. There are no rules for following this path. And, and this is really important. God is well pleased by any effort we make to communicate. Which is to say, to return to love. God is well pleased. God is well pleased with us all the time, even when we're not making an effort. When we're not making an effort, He's saying, hey, where are you at? I've been looking for you. 
You were missing from the breakfast table this morning. Right? So, okay. I'm going to read one more poem that... Uh, So, yeah, so we don't want to be telling people too much about how to pray. Oh, here's, here's the roomie. Be friends with your burning. As for your forms of expression, those who pay attention to forms and ways of speaking are one sort. Lovers who burn are another. Don't impose a property tax on a burned-out village. Got to think about that for a second. Yeah. Don't scold the lover for the wrong way he talks is a hundred times better than the right way of another. It doesn't matter which direction you point your prayer rug in. An ocean diver does not need snowshoes. The love religion needs no code or doctrine. Only love. And this, really, this is, this is you know, what, what we want to remember. Is that that's all that needs to happen is we need to ignite this love. And this is, and in the video, I mean, that, what, that, was, that, that was depressing at first. To me, I mean, it was a burden. Like, remember, I mean, but we know it. We see it every day, right? But the solution is stated very simply. is within you, but what is it that's within you? Love. The love that is within you. Give that. Let that show as kindness to those who come in front of you. So and this is the thing about, about Jesus. This is that he was a prophet. And this was and this was the message that from the inner experience of God that he had, the real experience of connection to God, where he actually could say, I am the Son of God. Further, you are the Son of God. And the kingdom of God does not come by saying low here, low there, going around searching. The kingdom of God is within you. Oh, that's what he said. It's within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And finding that kingdom of God within us then allows us to give love to what's in the outer. So, so Jesus is, is having a revelation. And let's remember that if, if we look, there's just little pieces and enticing, delicious intriguing little pieces in there that tell about his younger years in the Coptic Gospels. It's very clear that the people in his village did not think he was anybody special. They said, hey, who is this guy? Where, where did he come from with this message? Isn't that little Jesus? Mary's kid? Little Jesus from down the street? Who is this? It, 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 that's exactly what it says. And then, and then his family, they didn't know. They didn't, because this is what, this is the, this power of this transformation, see. We are, we are living, we, we go through our lives living a certain way, projecting a certain image, being certain people. And then when we begin to have this mystical experience, we begin to change. And we start offering something different to the world. And people look at that and say, what happened to him? What happened to her? Isn't that, don't we know her from on the corner? Right? And, and so then this Jesus said about this, he cannot be a prophet in your own land. And the reason he said that was people who know you, if they cannot release the image of you that they had from before, you really can't help them. So this is really speaking to their own inner thing that they've got to take care of, Right? So, what's he do? He comes out and then his family. His, now, you would think, right? You would think 
that if the stories, and by the way, you can see how these stories were crafted. If You would think, though, that if the stories about the whole miraculous virgin birth and all of that kind of stuff were true, that the angel visited Mary in this whole business, that Mary would have known that Jesus was this like divine person, right? But Mary comes and says, what happened to you? What is wrong with you? Mary comes and try to get him from preaching to people. Say, come home with us. And his, and his brothers come and say, you have lost your mind. You need to come back home and stop doing this. People are getting upset. What happened was, the, all, we need to understand that these, the stories about the divinity is a common practice was to show a special person as having a special kind of birth. It's symbolic. It's trying, to t it's trying to paint the story, right? But what really happened was, Jesus was an ordinary kid. He was an ordinary teenager. He became enlightened because he had a mystical experience. And the experience was so powerful that he realized that he was one with God. And that so were the rest of us. So then, he comes out and he starts hanging out with outcasts. He starts making friends with people that nobody else would have anything to do with. He hung out with women, which we've talked about before. You say, well, what's wrong with hanging out with women? Oh, no, you didn't be hanging out with any, no women that are not in your family. Women were not supposed to be hanging out with you if you were not in their family. So when you say hung out with women, then it's kind of like women maybe of a little bit of a shady character, right? Hung out with women. T tax 